بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليتدبروا آياته وليتذكروا الألباب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن أصحاب الجنة اليوم في شغل فاكهون هم وأزواجهم في ظلال على الأرائك متكئون لهم فيها فاكهة ولهم ما يدعون سلام قولا من رب الرحيم وامتاز اليوم أيها المجرمون ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم أن لا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين وأن اعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم ولقد أضل منكم جبلا كثيرا أفلم تكونوا تعقلون هذه جهنم التي كنتم توعدون اصلوها اليوم بما كنتم تكفرون اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون ولو نشاء لطمسنا على أعينهم فاستبقوا الصراط فأنا يبصرون ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانتهم فما استطاعوا مضيا ولا يرجعون ومن نعمره ننكسه في الخلق أفلا يعقلون وما علمناه الشعر وما ينبغي له إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين لينذر من كان حيا ويحق القول على الكافرين أولم يروا أنا خلقنا لهم مما عملت أيدينا أنعاما فهم لها مالكون وذللناها لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب أفلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله آلهة لعلهم ينصرون لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون فلا يحزنك قولهم إنا نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون أولم يرى الإنسان أن خلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو خصيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه 
قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن فيكون إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصافات صفا فالزاجرات زجرا فالتاليات ذكرا إن إلهكم لواحد رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما ورب المشارق إنا زينا السماء الدنيا بزينة الكواكب وحفظا من كل شيطان مارد لا يسمعون إلى الملأ الأعلى ويقذفون من كل جانب دحورا ولهم عذاب واصب إلا من خطف الخطفة فأتبعه شهاب ثاقب فاستفتهم أهم أشد خلقا أم من خلقنا إنا خلقناهم من طين لازب بل عجبت ويسخرون وإذا ذكرت لا يذكرون وإذا رأوا آية يستسخرون وقالوا إن هذا إلا سحر مبين أإذا متنا وكنا ترابا وعظاما أئنا لمبعوثون أو آباؤنا الأولون قل نعم وأنتم داخرون فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم ينظرون وقالوا يا ويلنا هذا يوم الدين هذا يوم الفصل الذي كنتم به تكذبون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Subhanallah, exalted be our Lord over all that others unto him falsely ascribe. How powerful is he? He created us from one soul and made us into many nations and diverse tribes. How magnificent is he? He assigned for us noble angels to protect us and to be watchful scribes.
How sublime is he! On judgment day, no intercessor will be of benefit against him, nor will any bribes. How merciful is he! We ask him to be amongst the inhabitants of Jannah, a place that words cannot describe. Today, inshaAllah Ta'ala will be doing three surahs and we start off with Surah Yaseen. And I will say that Surah Yaseen isn't just my favorite surah, it is everybody's favorite surah, Alhamdulillah. And Surah Yaseen, it goes back to the early uh, Meccan period. And the primary theme of Surah Yaseen throughout the entire surah beginning to end, it is to prove the hereafter and that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is indeed the one who will bring back our souls and uh, resurrect us. And there are a number of narrations found in our books of Hadith that mention that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised Surah Yaseen. In some narrations, he called it the Qalb Al-Quran, the heart of the Quran. Scholars differ about the authenticity of those narrations, but there's no problem in narrating them and saying these are found in the books of Hadith. And it is authentically narrated for sure that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he instructed us, he encouraged us to recite Surah Yaseen over those who are on their last, uh, on, the, on the very last throes of life. They're about to pass on from this world. They're on their deathbeds, we should ease that uh, by reciting Surah Yaseen. And of course, what a beautiful surah because the concept of Surah Yaseen is to talk about the hereafter and the next life. And so Surah Yaseen is giving them comfort that this is just the beginning of inshaAllah ta'ala, a brighter life after this. Uh, the story begins, or Surah Yaseen begins story with the power of the Quran and the uh, the impact that the Quran has on the people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions that they have put a bar that Allah has placed a barrier in front of those who reject the Quran. And He has placed a barrier behind them and He has enshrined them so that they can cannot even see. And it is authentically narrated that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was surrounded on the night of the Hijrah to Medina, he exited his house and there were over 40, 50 people wanting to kill him. And all he did, he recited Surah Yaseen. And he recited, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ We blinded them فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ They will not be able to see. He recited the Surah Yaseen and the first page of Surah Yaseen and they were blinded. They had no idea that the Prophet Sallallahu is walking from right under their uh, midst. And in this surah as well, verse number 12, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Inna nahnu nuhyil mawta. We shall indeed bring back the dead. We shall revive the dead. ma qaddamu wa atharahum. And we will write down everything that they have forwarded. And we're even going to write down their footsteps and their legacies and everything we have tallied together in a clear book in an imam, in a book that is prescribed. And it is reported that the Prophet Sallallahu used this verse when a tribe by the name of Banu Salama wanted to sell everything and move to the center of Medina so that they could live next to the Prophet Sallallahu They said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to pray every prayer with you and we walk all the way from our houses an hour away and we pray and we walk back. We decided to sell everything and come close to you so that we can be with you short walks. And our Prophet Sallallahu Allahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Bani Salama, that oh, uh, 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 the people of the Salama, diyarukum tuktabu atharukum. Stay in your houses. Your footsteps are being recorded by Allah. And in one report, he recited this verse, or this verse was revealed uh, basically as a second time that we're going to write down every footstep, no matter how small it is that we do something for the sake of Allah. Don't look at how insignificant it is. Whatever it is, one footstep you do for the sake of Allah, Allah will record it, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will reward you for it. So Yasin then moves on to the story of the three people who were sent to a neighboring town. First there were two, they rejected them, then Allah added a third, فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثِ And most likely this is a reference to the early followers of Jesus Christ of Isa, and they were preaching uh, to the people who did not believe in Allah. And so the righteous Christians, three of them, they went to the town of Antioch, and they were rejected, and they were mocked, and they were about to be killed when a local person came rushing and وَجَاءَ رَجُمْ الْأَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ And a man came uh, from the furthest part uh, of the town 
And he said, A man came from the furthest part of the town rushing. And he said, He said, Oh my people, follow the, these uh, messengers. By messengers, he doesn't mean prophets of God. He means messengers that have been sent by another prophet, meaning Isa has sent them, whether alive or dead, whether in the life of Isa, excuse me, or whether Isa was lifted up. Isa did not die, that was a slip of the tongue. But Isa, radiallahu uh, Isa uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, he sent his followers either in his lifetime Time, or he told them after he was raised up to go and preach. So Isa went, his followers went to the town of Antioch and they're preaching to the town of Antioch. And one of the locals embraces the message. And he says that you should follow these three people. And the locals were about to kill the three people, the three disciples of Jesus or the three followers of Christianity. And one of their own seems to have sided with the followers of Jesus. So they then turn their anger on one of their own. And and they surround this other person whom they knew very well, a nobleman from their own town. And they say to him, have you embraced this faith? And he says, Why shouldn't I embrace this faith? Why shouldn't I worship the one who created me? And you shall all be going back to him. Do you want me to worship false gods instead of him? Indeed, if the Rahman desires a harm for me, all of these gods will not help me, nor will they save me. If if I were to do this, inni idhan lafi dalalim mubin, I would be completely lost and misguided. Inni amantu bi rabbikum. I have believed in your Lord, your Creator. So listen to me, obey me. It was said, enter Jannah. There is a missing scene here. It is understood by the context. And that missing incident is that they killed him. They murdered him. The people of Antioch or this people of this town, they ganged up on one of their own and they massacred, they killed uh, this person and uh, they beat him to death. And when they beat him to death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they were killed him in this world. And because he's a shaheed, he is automatically in Jannah. It was said to him, enter Jannah. And when he sees Jannah, what does he say? How I wish my people could see this. How I wish they could know that my Lord has forgiven me and my Lord has shown so much honor on me. Subhanallah, this was a man whom the people killed. They ganged up on, they beat him to death. According to one report, they literally kicked him and they punched him until he died. And as soon as he is killed, he wakes up in Jannah. Literally one second he is being killed, the next second he sees Jannah and what is on his mind? He says, oh, how I wish my very people who killed me, how I wish that I could show them this reality that I'm speaking the truth to them, I'm telling them the truth. And what this shows as some of the Sahaba remarked, that this was a person who truly cared about his people while alive and then in death as well. That even when they killed him, his heart was still full of compassion that I want my people to know the truth. And what this shows us, if you want to influence others, if you want to guide others, if you want to be a preacher or caller to Islam and to walk in the footsteps of the prophets of Allah, then you must, you must have a genuine compassion, a genuine love for the people that you want to guide. You will not guide people if you have a sense of arrogance and hatred in your heart against them. And the story of this man clearly shows that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, he, he mentions that even the creation and the angels, they express their pity and their frustration at the stubbornness of men. Verse 30, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. This is something that the angels and the creation is saying, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels and the creation are saying out, woe is it to these servants, these creation, this man. Alas for these servants, these creations that are known as men. No messenger comes to them, but they ridicule him. Don't they understand? What is their problem? Why are they so stubborn about accepting the truth and about submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the creation is expressing its pity and its frustration that out of all of the species on earth, it is only man who is so arrogant as to reject the truth. And they are wondering what is wrong with us? Ya hasratan al ibad. And hasra is a sense of both frustration and pity. Like, come on, what's your, what's wrong with you? You know, accept the uh, invitation of the prophets and messengers. And then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three ayah. Wa ayatullahum, wa ayatullahum, wa ayatullahum. Three 
signs, three miracles that shows not only that he is the Rabb, but also that he is capable of bringing the dead back to life. The first of them, a sign for them is in the dead land. We give it life and we produce from it grains and corn and crops so that they can eat. And that they can eat of the fruits and they can also eat of what their hands have helped to produce. Won't they be uh, appreciative? Glory be to Allah who created everything in pairs. The fruits are in pairs and they themselves are in pairs. And even things that they do not do know, they're also in pairs. So this is the first sign, the one who can bring the dead land back to life and the one who can create life from seeds and the one who can produce crops and grains, that one can also bring you back from the dead. The second, Another miracle and sign for them is the night that we strip it away from the day. The day and the night, they go slowly but surely, gradually they merge into one another. And the sun, it runs towards its destination. It has an appointed uh, point, uh, appointed uh, course that it is following. Such is the power and design of the one who is all powerful, the one who is all mighty. And the moon, we have disposed of it in various places. And the manazil is a phrase in Arabic that means every single night the moon has a special manzil. There are around 28, they say manazil of the moon, then one night the moon is not seen. And so 28 manazil are of there of the moon. This is the astronomical calendar of the moon. And Allah is saying, I am the one who has put the moon in these manazil. manazil. Until when it comes back, it returns like the old twig, al-urujun al-qadim. And if you've ever seen an old twig from the tree of the dates, you will see that it looks like a crescent, very fragile, very yellowish, very thin. And so Allah is comparing that when the moon comes back, it looks like this old twig. That uh, Then Allah says, that neither can the sun overtake the moon. nahar. Nor will the night outpace the day. Kullun fi falakin yasbahun. Everyone is in its place in harmonious orbit. This is the second sign. The one who can control these massive celestial objects, that entity can also bring you back from the dead. And the third of his majestic signs that he asks us to think about is the fact that we have been given power over the creation. We can do amazing feats. We can ride the waves and the oceans. Who could have ever imagined that us creatures were going to be able to conquer the oceans and in our times even more than this. There is no problem. It is a part of our tafsir genre and tafsir methodology to extrapolate from these verses the blessings of cars and airplanes that Allah is saying, I gave you this knowledge and I blessed you with this type of technology that you're able to benefit. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the one who has given you so much knowledge that you can then do all of this, surely that entity can also then bring the dead back to life. Now what is the response to all of these miracles? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says verses 44 onwards that Allah says that no miracle comes to them, no sign comes to them except that they are mu'ridin, they turn their backs away. And when they're reminded, when the people come and try to advise them, when it is said to them, Anfiqu mimma razaqakum Allah, spend from what Allah has given you. Those who reject, they say to those who believe, why should we feed those whom if Allah wanted, He could feed directly? You are all lost and misguided. You want us to take care of the poor people? Allah created them, Allah made them hungry, let Allah feed them directly. And what a powerful uh, analogy is being given here, I should, not analogy, a powerful, uh, if you like, uh, symbolic difference between the attitudes of those who believe and those who reject. Look at the completely contradictory mentalities. The believer, the mu'min, the one who wants to worship Allah, he sees hungry people and immediately what comes to his mind? Allah has given me more than them. Let me help them. I want Allah to use me to do good. I want to be servicing the creation of Allah with the blessings that Allah has given me. I want to be an instrument in spreading Allah's mercy. So he looks at the scene and he says, you know what? I want to make a difference and I want to feed the hungry. And he says, come, let's all donate, let's come together, let's feed the hungry. Now, what do those who reject 
religiosity, who, re who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, they become sarcastic, they become haughty and arrogant. And they say, why should I feed? I mean, your God is all powerful. Your God is the one that did all of this anyway. He can feed himself. And this is the difference between Iman and Kufr, between religiosity and atheism. A religious person, a person who believes in Allah, a person whose heart is full of compassion, he looks and he sees, what can I do to make a difference? Whereas the one who has no faith, you will find him to be bitter, angry, arrogant, always mocking. Oh, well, why doesn't your God do it? Why doesn't your God take care of it? And this person doesn't understand that perhaps that hungry person is there so that Allah can see what we do. And Allah will reward the hungry person. Allah, Allah will reward us. There's a hereafter that we have to also take into account. But look at the difference. And this is the exact same difference, by the way, between Adam and Iblis. Adam and Iblis. Adam said, I made a mistake. What can I do to make up for it? Iblis said, it's all your fault, O oh Allah. You're the one who did all of this. It's not my fault. This uh, difference in mentality, it goes back all the way to the beginning of the creation. Dear Muslim, when you see something negative, think about how you can make it into a positive. Think about what can I do to better the situation. Don't blame anyone else and whatnot. I mean, even if people are worthy of being blamed, that has its place if somebody else is at fault, but you also have a role. What can I do to make it better? And this verse really shows us the attitude of the mu'min is always proactive. It's always bringing benefit wherever the person goes. Whereas the person of no faith, all they do is they sit back and criticize and worse than this, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, the one of no faith actually ends up blaming a'udhu billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal then reminds them in Surah Yasin of what will happen when the day of judgment uh, occurs. That uh, it's only just one, uh, one trumpet blow and lo and behold, they will be brought before us. They shall be resurrected. Qawlu ya waylina, verse 52, man ba'athana min marqadina. Who has resurrected us from our resting place, our graves? We were here, what's going on here? Then the believers will say to them, Hada ma wa'ada rahman wa sadaq al mursaloon. This is the promise of a Rahman and the, the prophets spoke the truth to us. And this shows us that on, on the day of judgment, people will be cognizant enough, aware enough to ask questions and to have conversations. And so people will be wondering what is going on? Where are we? Why are we being resurrected? What's going on? And the righteous will say that this is now the time that all of you denied. It is now happening over here. And then in uh, verses 55 onwards, Allah describes the people of Jannah and the people of Jahannam. Inna ashab al al yawma fi shughlin The inhabitants of Jannah, the people of Jannah, on that day, they shall be busy in entertainment. What an interesting way. Shughul and fakihun. So shughul is to be uh, busy and fakihun is to be basically having a fun time. So Allah is saying that Jannah, there will be so much to do that you will be busy entertaining yourselves, that you lived a difficult life, you worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you will be spoiled for pleasures, anything that you want. Hum wa azwajuhum them and their spouses, they shall be in shades, reclining on couches. They will have in it all types of fruits, all types to eat. And they will have whatever they desire, whatever you want. Dear Muslims, whatever you want, you will get it in Jannah. A Sahabi said, O Messenger of Allah, you know, I like to plant. I like to have a green thumb. I like to plant and I like to have grow trees. So will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow me to uh, grow trees in Jannah? And the Prophet sallallahu gave a beautiful description. Yes, indeed, you will grow the tree. It will grow this big and this and that. At which one of the muhajirun said, O Messenger of Allah, that person who asked you, he must be from our Ansari brethren because us muhajirun, we do not like to work in the backyard. We don't like to work in the fields at all. So the point is that whatever you have as your mind, some people say, why does Jannah describe only certain you know worldly pleasures and the response is this is but one example and it is an example by the way that all of mankind appreciates and likes the pleasures of the soul the pleasures of the body eating and drinking and the sensual pleasures of course this is a part and parcel of Jannah but it's not all of Jannah Jannah is more than this this verse is very clear whatever you want shall be yours if you want to interact or have discussions or talk or you know whatever you want to do 
do, you will be able to do that in that place forever and ever without ever getting bored. Fi shughulin fakihun. They will be busy entertaining themselves. And then the best of all pleasures, the highest of all pleasures, verse 58, salamun qawla min rabbir rahim. They shall hear Allah say salam to them. And then other verses describe the seeing of Allah. So hearing the speech of Allah and seeing the face of Allah, this is the highest reward of Jannah. Nothing is higher than that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jahannam before moving on to the final concluding passages of this surah by reminding man of a number of obvious blessings of them. Verse 71, Don't they see that we have gifted them from what we ourselves have, have uh, brought about livestock that they own? That we have subdued it for them. So uh, some of them they ride and some of them they eat. And they have other benefits. And they drink from these animals. Will they not give thanks? And this verse or this series of verses, once again, it goes back to a point I made a number of lectures ago. This is one of the most explicit verses that not all species are the same. The one who created the species has the right to provide a hierarchy of those species. And in these series of verses, you cannot get more clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we created these animals and species, these livestock, and we, I said, and we subdued these species for them. Look, these animals are bigger than us. They are heavier than us. They are more powerful than us. And yet they are dhalil unto us. And dhalil here means that we have control over them they have submitted and subdued on, uh, themselves unto us. And Allah says, we're allowed to ride them, we're allowed to eat them, we're allowed to take their milk, their drink. This is very clear. And they have other benefits as well. In some places and lands, you need to use their leather to protect yourself from this and that. So Allah Azza wa Jal is explicitly allowing us, if again, we treat them ethically and we do everything in accordance with the name of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. then yes, it is permissible to benefit. And so Allah says, Afala yashkurun. Will they not give uh, thanks? This is one of the blessings at the end of the surah. Another, or another miracle, another miracle that Allah says, Awalam yara insanu. Doesn't mankind see that we created him? from a nutfa, from a, a, a seed, a mixture of fluids. And yet, فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ Lo and behold, he comes from a despised fluid. And yet he has the arrogance. He has the audacity to challenge us. وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَ And he starts arguing with us. He produces his pseudo evidences against us, even as he forgets his own creation. And he challenges who is going to bring the dead back after they have decayed. This is a reference to uh, Abu Jahl or perhaps Umayyah uh, that uh, uh, a number of uh, books mention that when uh, once one of these leaders of the Quraysh uh, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Umayyah bin Khalaf or Abu Jahl or somebody else, he picked up a bone that was decaying and he crumbled it in his hands and he wagged this bone and he crumbled it in his hands and he said that do you think that uh, O Muhammad Sallallahu do you think that your Lord will bring my bones back after they have become Ramim like this? And so Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed Surah Yaseen in which Allah describes not just his state of mind, but the state of mind of anyone who is so arrogant as to reject Allah, to deny a God. This verse is so powerful. There he is in his arrogance saying, where is the proof? Show me the signs. And he has forgotten, ignored his own creation. Are you that blind that you're demanding proof when you yourself are the greatest proof of the existence of Allah? He who cannot even see his own existence as a proof of the existence of the Creator, what other proof is ever going to satisfy him or her? Look at how powerful this verse is. What other proof do you need that there's a powerful Creator out there? Look at your own body. Look at where you came from. Look at how you live. Look at each and every aspect of the creation. And that's why Allah Azza wa is saying throughout the Quran, they're asking you for miracles. The miracles around them are enough. These other miracles are not going to make them uh, believe. And this is a reality that anybody 
who negates uh, the existence of a God. The fact of the matter is that they keep on demanding for proof. The fact of the matter is there is no proof that would satisfy them. Nothing would satisfy them. And what they claim is mere words. If the creation around you is not enough to prove to you the existence of a creator, what other evidences is there? So these are the Quranic uh, arguments, so simple, so straightforward, so incontrovertible. They're watertight. That's the beauty of the Quranic arguments. They're watertight. They appeal to every single person. And this is one of the strongest arguments that uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla uses, not just for his existence, but in fact, for the, uh, for the bringing back of the dead and the, uh, the day of judgment. And Allah Azza wa Jalla also says in verse 80, that he is the one who has produced for you fuel min al-shajr al-akhdar from the green trees which you kindle your fire with. So the wood that you use, all types of fuel that you use, he is the one who gifted it for you. Can't the one who created this recreate it all over again? Of course he can. إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْءً يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ His command when he wills something is to merely say be and it is. So all glory be to him in whose hands is the control and dominion of all things and to him we shall all return. This is Surah Yasin. Surah Safat is the next surah that we're going to do today. And Surah Safat is a, all three surahs today will be Makki uh, surahs. Uh, and Surah Safat displays all of the classical features of the early Meccan surahs. Powerful verses, short verses, rhythmic style, miscellaneous topics, all weave together seamlessly in some of the most powerful uh, rhetoric in the entire Quran. Surah Safat is again one of the favorites of most of the Quran. You listen to them when they recite Safat, you will see the beauty clearly in the early Meccan uh, surahs. It's around seven pages and it has 182 verses, which shows you the verses are very short. If it has 182 and only seven pages. And the theme of the surah, the primary theme of the surah is to demonstrate the power of Allah through his creation, and then also through the stories of the previous prophets, that the righteous are protected, and those who reject Allah Azza wa Jal do not have that protection. And the word Safat comes from the word for Saf, for lining up. And the reference here was Safat Safa, the first verse. The reference here is that the angels of Allah, they all line up in rows. And that's why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted us when we pray our prayers to line up in rows. And he said, this is how the angels line line up when they are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are mimicking the angels straight rows and we are all praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that the angels do and we on earth, we are taking that from them. So wasafati safa, by the angels that line up in rows, fazajirati zajra, and those that are constantly driving the uh, clouds, and those that are constantly reciting the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is swearing by all of these angels. This surah, by the way, another sub motif, angels and also jinn and, and uh, shayateen. There's a sub motif, a number of references to shayateen and uh, to uh, angels as well. So, inna ilahakum lawahid, your God is indeed one. Rabbu samawati wal ardi wa bainahuma wa rabbul mashariq. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and the Lord of all that is between them and the Lord of all all directions here. Indeed, we have adorned inna zayyanna sama dunya. We have beautified the lower heavens bizinatinil kawakib with the beauty of all of these stars and all of these celestial objects. Subhanallah. How powerful is this verse? Allah is saying essentially that the skies were boring and we wanted to make them look beautiful. So we created all of these planets, we created all of these stars so that the skies would look beautiful. So of the reasons why Allah created all of this, there are other reasons as well, of the reasons that Allah Azza wa Jal created these celestial objects around us, inna zayyanna sama dunya bizinatinil kawakib. All of these things, we have created them to look, to make the skies look beautiful. And uh, the Quran of course mentions other reasons as well. And the surah, as as I said, also has a number of references to the world of the angels and the world of the jinns. So verse 150, for example, onwards, that uh, Did we create the angels as females? Remember the Quraysh, they assumed that the angels are female and the angels are daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is asking the Quraysh, were you there? Did you see the creation? Do you know that the angels are female? 
No, indeed. This is one of their lies. It's one of their lies. And they claim Allah, that Allah has children. The pagans would claim that the daughters, that uh, the angels are the daughters of Allah and that they are our intercessors. They are lying. Do you think that your own creator, you prefer boys over girls in your life and then you ascribe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will prefer girls over boys. This is a contradiction in your own philosophy. What is the matter with you? Don't you judge in your own selves? Don't you reflect over this? Do you have an evidence? Then bring your book if you are telling the truth. Verse 158, and they invented and they invented a relationship, a lineage between him and the jinn by claiming that the jinn uh, are the daughters of Allah Azza wa So they invented this lineage. But indeed, Allah is saying those jinn, those jinn, they know that they will be brought forth and they will be questioned and arraigned for all that, that, that they have done. And as for the angels, verse 164 onwards, that وَإِنَّا uh, لَنَحْنُ الصَّافُونَ Allah is praising the angels and He is causing the angels to tell us what they say. So this is what the angels are telling us, that we are lined up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are the ones who arrange everything and we are the ones مُسَبِّحُونَ constantly praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the angels are orderly and the angels are efficient and the angels are constantly engaged in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that the angels they do not ever get even the Quran mentions this la yufatarun they never get tired they constantly make tasbih they do not marry or eat or drink because they are angels and they never get tired of constantly worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what these series of verses uh, tells the next section verses 50 to 62 it has a very famous passage that marks a conversation between the inhabitants of Jannah and the inhabitants of Jahannam, where a person of Jannah will remember, Inni kana li qareen. I used to have a friend, an associate, an acquaintance, somebody used to hang around, you know, somebody used to work with. Qareen is somebody I'd be, be in the next to. That I had somebody in this world that he would make fun of me. And he would tell me that you want me to believe you that there's gonna be a heaven and hell, there's a hereafter. and while he is remembering this conversation and from this some of our scholars have derived him of course the concept is definitely very easily uh, derivable but this is one of the evidences that in jannah we will have perfect memories and all of our people that we have met we shall remember them our entire lives they're going to be uh, at our disposal and so any acquaintance any friend that we had and they are in jannah we want to meet with them we can meet with them and what if they are not in jannah we want to see what's happening Sometimes Allah might even do this as well. That in this case it says uh, that uh, that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal will open up a portal and the angel will say, do you want to see where that friend is now that you used to have? Uh, not necessarily friend, Qadeen simply means, I used to have somebody used to hang around. So uh, he will say, uh, do you want to see where, where he ended up? And so that portal will open up. And that man of Jannah will now see the person of Jahannam. And he will say to him, قَالَتْ اللَّهِ إِنْ turdin That by Allah, you almost ruined me. You constantly used to put these doubts into my, my hand, my head. وَلَوْلَا نِعْمَةُ رَبِّي Were it not for the grace of of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I too would be with you. In other words, if I had listened to you, if I had had your doubts and I followed them, subhanAllah, I would be where you are. And so subhanAllah, we do have an obligation to fight these uh, doubts that are incorrect doubts, because in the end of the day, they are incorrect and we will end up regretting uh, in the hereafter. Uh, the bulk of the surah, Surah Safat, has to do with the stories of the previous prophets. And uh, verses 75 to 82 is the story of Nuh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we saved him and his family from the great calamity. So too will Allah save everyone from calamities when they turn to him. The one who saved Nuh from the great flood can save you and me from the flood of our worries as well. Verses 83 to 113. It is the longest story in Safat, and it is the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam 
two segments of the story. Firstly, that when he came to Allah with the Qalbin Salim, and this is not the only time that Ibrahim is described as Qalbin Salim. Qalbin Salim, the pure heart. Ibrahim has that pure heart. And he, the story of his destruction of the idols is mentioned over here, that he uh, made sure that all of them were destroyed and he showed his people the, the uh, ridiculousness, the foolishness of worshiping false gods. Then the story moves on to Ishaq alayhi salam. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِيَ When Ishaq became old enough to uh, work with him and walk with him, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِيَ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ He said, Oh my son, I see in a dream that I am sacrificing you. So what do you think I should do? And the scholars say he was only asking Ishaq to see whether he would have to force him, or whether Ishaq would willingly follow along. And of course, as we know, the dreams of the prophets are true. No one else has necessarily true dreams. As for the prophets, all of their dreams are true. And so his, his son says, my father, do what Allah has commanded you to do. So the both of them went, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ Then when he placed both of them, they submitted to Allah, and he placed his forehead on the ground and he raised the axe up. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَنْ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا Oh Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the dream. Whatever dream you saw, you have fulfilled it. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ And we substituted him with a my sacrifice, which is what we commemorate uh, at Eid al-Adha every single uh, year. And next section, verses 114 to 122, is the section of Musa and Harun. And Allah mentions the blessings that he gave them and he helped them by giving them the book and the both of them, they left an honorable legacy. And then the story moves on to Ilyas and to Lut and to Yunus. And of course here uh, is uh, Yunus's uh, story when uh, in verse 141 uh, of the fact that فَسَاهَمَ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْمُدَحَظِيمِ Lots were cast on the boat, that somebody in the boat, they assumed that this is happening because there's one person on the boat that is bringing back bad luck, this was their, their practice. And so they cast lots that who is the one that's bringing this bad luck. And of course they were non-Muslims. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Yunus is of course the prophet of Allah and the lot was against him. What is he going to do? They put him and they throw him over the side of the boat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in verse 140, uh, 142, wa huwa mulim. This is the only explicit reference in the Quran for the whale swallowing Yunus. Uh, of course, the whale is mentioned mentioned Dhunun, the person of the fish is mentioned, uh, but uh, the, the explicit swallowing is mentioned over here. فَالْتَقَمَهُ الْحُوتُ وَهُوَ مُلِيمُ That he was guilty, and that's why Allah caused uh, this massive beast to swallow him. فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ Were it not for the fact that Yunus made tasbih of Allah, لَلَبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He would have remained in the stomach of the whale until the day of judgment. So too, when we are in distressful situations, so too, when we are surrounded by calamities upon calamities, let us remember the tasbih of Allah and let us remember the dua of the noon, the dua of Yunus. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al This is the dua that will save us from our calamities as it saved Yunus from the belly of the whale. And this surah, it ends with a series of iconic uh, verses. Again, they're a favorite of the Quran. They're recited a lot of times. Uh, that uh, for Subhanallah, that exalted be Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, amma yasifun above all of their allegations. Wa salamun ala mursaleen. And the meaning here that. Allah Azza wa Jal is far more noble and exalted than how any of those who reject him describe him. Any person who rejects Allah, any person who follows false gods, when they describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal is far above, he is far more exalted. And that is what subhana means here. The meaning of subhana is that you negate from Allah the negatives that people ascribe. To negate the negatives is to affirm the positive. You negate that which is negative, so you're affirming the positive. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ And peace is upon the messengers because they came to teach you who is Allah and how to worship Allah. وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world. So that's a beautiful ending of Surah Al-Safat. Surah Al-Sad now, we get to Surah Sad, excuse me, Surah Sad. 
It is the only surah in the whole Quran that begins with the letter Sa'd. And uh, Surah Sa'd and Surah As-Safat, they are very similar in their uh, content. There's a little bit of, of overlap as well, and there's also a continuation. And yet the style are, is markedly different. So if you read Sa'fat and you read Sa'd, they are very different in their style. And in Surah Sa'd, you have the continuation of the stories of prophets that were not mentioned in Surah Sa'fat. So you have over here, for example, Adam and Dawood and Sulaiman and Ayyub. These were not mentioned in Surah Safat, and so they are continued in Surah uh, Sa'd. And Surah Sa'd, it begins by describing the arrogance and the haughtiness of the pagans in rejecting the message simply because they did not understand and they did not believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they did not believe in the oneness of Allah. That wa'ajibu an ja'ahum munthiru minhu, verse number four. They marveled, they marveled that a warner has come from amongst them. وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ And the kuffar said, this is a lying magician. Whatever slurs you can throw, أَجْعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا wahida. Has he made all of our gods only one? إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ This is something strange, this is something unbelievable. How could he do this? And again, this shows us the finicky nature of the human mind, that whatever society one is born into, whatever culture one happens to be, you automatically absorb the values of that culture. And when somebody comes and preaches to you a very sensible message, there's one God, it's so logical, you cannot get your mind around something that is alien to your own culture. And you start rejecting simply because it is different from what you happen to have been born into and the time frame of your society. And I keep on telling us this message that dear Muslims, let us not follow the mindset of the Quraysh. True, the most of us no longer see these multiple gods around us. So we're not understanding this. At the same time, there are so many other issues that we absorb from our cultures and our time frames. There's so many other ideas and isms that we think are the ultimate ultimate truth, even though when you study them historically, they themselves are products of plenty of variations and specific times and frames. And here we think that they are the ultimate truth. And then we expect Islam to conform with them. On the contrary, we need to be critical enough to engage and let us not create false gods amongst our own modern understandings of ethics and, and philosophy and politics, and then think that they are the gods like the Quraysh had, such that when Islam comes, we say, how can Islam come and preach something that our society doesn't hold to be true? Let us think critically and rationally. Let us take a step back and judge and then see that in fact, we are products of our times like the Quraysh were products of their times and that the truth transcends any one culture and time and place. And so the Quraysh rejected Islam because in Nahada Lashun Ujab, this is something strange. Who does this anymore? And the uh, the, story, the the surah then continues by mentioning the stories of the previous prophets and how Allah subhanahu wa taala protected uh, those who believed in the prophets and uh, rejected and uh, destroyed those who rejected. So the prophet Nuh is mentioned. Uh, the peoples of Ad and Thamud are mentioned. Fir'aun is mentioned, and then the story moves on to Dawood alayhi salam and Sulaiman, and this is the main portion of Surah Sad. And the story of Dawood, uh, one incident is mentioned that is not mentioned anywhere else in the Quran, and that is when two people jumped into a private garden of his and they, he became worried because there were not supposed to be anybody there. And they said, don't worry, we are having a dispute and we want you to be our judge. And uh, the story has raised quite a lot of interpretations and there are many different understandings of what exactly happened. I'll give you one of them, which seems to be pretty straightforward from the reading of the story. And that is that, in fact, these two men were not men, they were angels. And that Allah sent them to test Dawood and to see how fair of a judge he would be. And so he presented two people outwardly. They had certain characteristics where you would automatically sympathize with one over the other. And then the one you would sympathize with has a very sorry story, a very uh, story of room taking place that I have a mean partner. He's done this to me. He's done that to me. He's richer than me. And he wants to even take whatever I have. Now he has 99 you know, animals and I only have one. And he's trying to take that from me. He's being mean and nasty to me. And so Dawood 
feels sympathy and he immediately says, oh, لَقَدْ ظَلَمَكَ بِسُؤَالِهِ He has done dhulm to you. This man has done dhulm to you. He should not have done this. And then according to one interpretation, they disappeared. And Dawood understood that these two were not men, they were angels and that they came to test Dawood and that Dawood did not necessarily pass this test. How and why so? Because Dawood السلام, was hasty in listening to one side and not the other. And he pronounced a judgment without hearing the other side. And that's why Allah says in verse 26, Ya Dawoodu, inna ja'annaka khalifatan fil ard. O Dawood, we have made you a ruler in this land. So judge between people with justice and do not follow your sympathies and desires. Justice is not based upon your sympathies. Justice requires a very, very impartial, a very a sense of acute, uh, you know, impartiality. Who says what? Why is it going on? And and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling Dawood that you should not have been hasty in this regard. And so Dawood fell down in sajda, in uh, thankfulness to Allah, and in uh, uh, asking Allah's forgiveness. And this is one of the places of sajda in the Quran. And this is but one interpretation. There are other interpretations, but this is a fairly straightforward one that does seem to fit with all the narratives. And also, by the way, the concept of listening to both sides is something that is very Islamic. How important is it, dear Muslim, that when you hear one side of the story, you do not pronounce a judgment. If this is to do with you, if it's something to do with your personal life, it's some your friend, your family involved, do not pass a judgment until you hear the other side. Listen to the explanation. Perhaps there's a completely different alternative that you never even it never even occurred to you that, hey, you know what? The entire story can be twisted in a different way and you only heard one side of the story. After this, the story of Suleiman is mentioned. And we hear about his power. We hear about all of the control that Allah had given him. And we understand from these verses as well. And again, these, uh, so there are three stories here that have generated a lot of discussion. What is the meaning of these verses? And again, that's for advanced tafsir to go into all the different narratives. I'm simply presenting to you uh, perhaps the easiest one that is the most apparent meaning from these, and there are others as well. So uh, the other uh, story of Sulaiman alayhi salam that he was looking at all of his horses and all of the wealth that Allah had given him, and perhaps he became uh, engrossed in all of the wealth that he had, and he realized that he was not worshiping Allah the way that Allah Azza wa Jal deserved to be worshipped. And so he turned back to Allah and repented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for allowing his wealth to temporarily distract him. And he then realized he had made a mistake and he turned back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And from this we learn that all of the wealth that we have, all of the power that we have, it should never distract us from our religious duties. And if it so happens that once or twice it does, we need to repent immediately to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and make up for that relapse for Allah is in indeed forgiving. And the third story here, which again has a lot of interpretation, that وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَى كُرْسِيهِ جَسَدًا ثُمَّ أَنَامٍ That we tested Sulaiman and we threw a body on his throne and then he returned. Again, a lot of cryptic uh, you know, uh, uh, um, stories are mentioned in the books of Tafsir and they're trying to unpack what is happening here. And again, one interpretation is that in one occasion, Suleiman left his kingdom to pursue uh, an expedition to go fight somewhere. And in the interim, a very demonic jinn pretended to be Suleiman and took on the garb of Suleiman and the demeanor of Suleiman and returned back. And the people thought that it was Suleiman. And so he ruled for a while and the people uh, of the uh, of the land thought that Suleiman is commanding all of these these evil things until Suleiman returned. Anaba here, if you were to go down this interpretation, means he returned back to the kingdom and then he expelled the uh, this evil demonic uh, jinn. And there are other interpretations as well. But from this interpretation, what we can derive is that even the best of people, even the most powerful of people, are tested. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're the king that rules over the jinn. Even you're going to face trials and you're going to have to deal with those trials. And when Suleiman returned and he conquered his kingdom again from this evil entity, 
uh, verse number 35, he made dua to Allah. Without dua, nothing is possible. And he makes dua to Allah. قَالَ رَبِّ هَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّن بَعْدِي Grant me a dominion that no other person shall have after me. And so out of all of the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, only Sulaiman was given the control of the jinn. And only Sulaiman was given so many other privileges that our Prophet said that I wanted to do it, then I realized my brother Sulaiman had made that dua, so I left it to him. I could have controlled the jinn, but I didn't want to do that because I remembered the dua of my brother Sulaiman. So out of camaraderie that he made that dua, I respect that dua, I'm not going to um, do that. And then we have the story of Ayyub as well. That uh, Ayyub alayhi salam made dua to Allah and uh, the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a river to flow right where he was. And he dipped in that river and he came out and he was cured of his leprosy and all of the uh, wounds and whatnot that he had. And uh, the story also has uh, that uh, the issue of uh, fulfilling his vow by taking some twigs or some stacks of hay. And what is the reference here? Our books of Tafsir mentioned that his wife was patient with him and his wife was servicing him throughout all of this time from everybody abandoned him except his wife. And once his wife did some Something that very, very much irritated him. What did she do? Again, books differ, but one, one, one narration says that she uh, sold her hair off as well uh, to make money, and this very much inf uh, infuriated Ayub. And he made a promise that if I ever get cured, then I will discipline you 100 times. How dare you have done that? He got very frustrated. But then he regretted the oath, but he made an oath in the name of Allah. So how could he get out of it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was merciful to Ayub, and he was merciful to the wife of Ayub. And he said to Ayub, basically, take a bunch of hay, 100 twigs or whatnot, and just, you know, tap it and you, you will, that will be your vow. It will count as your uh, vow. And we learn from this as well, uh, that when you fulfill your vows, when you, you should fulfill your vows, but there's always, if the, you made a vow in anger or something, there's ways to get out of it in a halal manner. Allah does not want to cause hardship on us. And the surah as well, it has the disputation amongst the people of Jahannam. Just like the previous surah between Jannah and Jahannam, this surah amongst the people of Jahannam, who is more guilty? Who is more worthy of being cursed? لا مرحبا بكم. No uh, greetings to you. قالوا ربنا من قد قدم لنا هذا فزد عذاب ضعف في النار. Each one of them is cursing uh, the other. We want to have the double punishment on whoever brought this about. Who are these? The followers and the leaders. The evil followers and the evil leaders. Each one is invoking mutual curses on each other. And then this surah concludes. After mentioning all of these prophets, it concludes with the story of Adam and Iblis. And this is the only surah in the Quran that concludes with the story of Adam and Iblis. And in this section, we learn how Allah honored Adam alayhi salam. That Allah says that, Ya Iblisu, ma mana'aka an tasjud lima khalaqtu biyadayya. That, O oh, Shaytan, O oh, Iblis, why did you not prostrate to that being whom I fashioned with my both hands? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing an honor to Adam that he did something with Adam that he did not do with any other entity. He honored Adam by fashioning him with his own hands. And uh, this story is indeed a reminder for all of us that concludes the, the last verses uh, of the surah, conclude by saying that this is but a reminder and indeed you will see how true. You will see how true all of this was after a short while. And inshallah ta'ala with this we'll conclude today, a reminder for those of you that are watching live, uh, that um, uh, these are obviously the last 10 nights have begun. So make sure that you are praying to Allah uh, every single night, uh, especially in the odd nights. And that would be uh, tomorrow night. And last night was the first of our odd nights. So make sure that inshallah ta'ala, you're doing extra prayers and make sure that you make the dua of Aisha radiallahu anha. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. May Allah make us of those who are praying on the night of Laylat al-Qadr. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya man ajabta dua nuhin fantasar wa hamaltahu fi fulkika al-mashhoon. Ya man ahalan nar hawl khalilihi روحا وريحانا بطولك كون